senior associate here at uh, CSIS in the Africa program and uh, the senior advisor in Africa for Africa at the uh, International Republican Institute. I know it's early this morning, so I presume only the love of Congo could get you here this early. So we appreciate you being here. And um, it's a great pleasure for me today to uh, welcome Martin Fayulu, uh, a friend, uh, an older brother that I've known for a number of years, and a Congolese uh, uh, standard bearer for democracy. As we know, Martin Fayulu is a Congolese politician and president of ECD, which is a political party. Uh, known as the Engagement pour la Citoyenneté et le Développement. He is also a coordinator for the Dynamique de l'Opposition, a political coalition. He was the joint opposition presidential candidate under the Lamuka coalition in 2018. He was accredited by the Catholic Church, various observing missions, and leaked data of the international press with over 60% of the vote during the polls. Fayulu spent 20 years working for American oil giant ExxonMobil <clears throat> in Africa, France, and in the United States as a managing director. He served as a provincial MP from 2006 to 2011, and as a national MP from 2011 to 2018. As an MP, he was one of the most vocal critics of then President Kabila and the leading anti-corruption and pro-democracy voice. He was widely, is widely credited for initiating a successful grassroots campaign uh, called uh, Do Not Touch My 220, which is a clause in the Constitution. He raised awareness about the importance to safeguard the article of the Constitution limiting presidential term, which eventually led to President Kabila not standing with, uh, for a third term. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, the Honorable Martin Fayulu. Bonjour. Merci. Très bien. Merci. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good morning. It is truly an honor for me and a great pleasure to be here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, one of the preeminent international political institutions in the world, an institution that focuses on studying issues of defense and security, regional studies, transnational challenges, uh, ranging from energy and commerce to world development and economic integration. Let me first of all uh, take this opportunity to uh, pay tribute to the founders of the CSIS, Mr. David Abshire and Admiral Arlie Burke, and to thank them for their legacy of giving us this platform for reflection, for research and an analysis so that we can produce political initiatives that will help us uh, anticipate the future and anticipate the changes that are to come. In front of this august assembly, allow me to also take this opportunity to thank the organizers of this meeting, in particular, Judd Dovermont and Catherine Chang, who have made this meeting possible this morning. I would also like to take advantage of this opportunity to extend my greetings to all the participants here this morning and to thank you for your presence and for being here despite the fact that you probably have many engagements. Ladies and gentlemen, the Democratic Republic of Congo, my country, is a vast country of 2.3 million square kilometers with a population of over 80 million inhabitants and this country is suffering. It continues to suffer more and to be thrown into poverty uh, on an increasing basis. The education of our children has been deteriorating over the years. Public health, medical coverage is quasi inexistent. Access to drinking water and to electricity is a nightmare for the majority of the population. 
the, route, the roads are completely dilapida dilapidated, and this is something that is a major barrier to development. Agriculture, which in the time in the past has been the jewel of the Congolese economy, has now been completely abandoned. Public administration is completely corrupt. The mining sector, which is poorly managed, is still a sector that is pillaged by predators of, on the Congolese economy, predators who are both domestic and foreign. And there is no sign of industrialization on the horizon. Insecurity has been hitting our country full force, especially in the eastern part of the country, particularly in Kivu and Ituri. The Ebola epidemic has become a major problem for our country. However, the population does not seem to be taking this seriously. Uh, just to give you a few figures, we have already recorded 1,044 cases of Ebola, 652 deaths, and 325 people who have been healed. I personally traveled to the region of Butembo uh, in the eastern part of the country where we have seen a lot of the Ebola crisis. This was last February. And I sent a message to the population trying to help them to understand the full threat and the scope of the threat posed by Ebola and that they take this, uh, this threat very seriously. I have also uh, visited the Crisis Response Center to encourage the courageous men and women who are doing remarkable work to fight Ebola. Before I went there, only the uh, Bishop of Butembo had, was talking about this epidemic. Nobody else was talking about it. And the bishop uh, had been criticized by the population. And when I went there, I called together a, a community meeting and I talked about this issue. And the population finally understood that they had to react. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, after two years of waiting, finally, on December 30th, 2018, in the hope of bringing about democratic transition to our country, a true change of power, the Congolese people went out to the polls to vote for their new president of the republic, as well as for the deputies in the uh, parliament at the national and provincial le level. Despite the fact that there were numerous issues and questions about the voter lists and the use of the voting machines. As you probably know, the voter lists uh, was this object of controversy, uh, that there were a many thousand uh, voters who uh, were uh, taken off the list. And out of the 41,000 or so voters that we uh, found that there were some that were fictitious names uh, and recommendations were produced to this effect after about 10 million uh, were uh, taken off the list. And this happened during the elections because during the elections, there were 18,300 uh, people who uh, came out to vote. 18 million, rather, excuse me, turnout. From January 9th through 10th, the Electoral Commission, rather than simply publishing the true results of the election, fabricated the results, the ones that were published, cynically ignoring the sovereignty of the Cong Congolese people. The results were contrary to the choice expressed by the population for all three elections, that is to say presidential, the national legislative elections, and the provincial legislative elections. We also brought a case to the Constitutional Court to ask for a recount of the vote. But the judges of the Constitutional Court, following the orders of Mr. Kabila, violated their mandate and refused to hear our petition. In the end, they confirmed the results, upheld the results published by the Electoral Commission and thereby discredited the institution of the Constitutional Court.
Meeting in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia on January 17, 2019, to examine the situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the heads of African states took a step in the right direction by calling on the Congolese authorities to abstain from, and I quote, to abstain from proclaiming the definitive results of the elections of December 30th, 2018, until a delegation could be rapidly deployed to, to Kinshasa, a high-level delegation including the President of the African Union, the President of the African Union Commission, and other heads of states and government, so that this delegation could dialogue with all the uh, stakeholders in the DRC in order to reach a consensus on how we could overcome this post-electoral crisis in the country." End of quote. The fact that this proposal was rejected, this continental in initiative was rejected, has discredited the African Union in an unprecedented way. The silence of African heads of states before this electoral crisis is a, a true concern. And today, more so than ever, the Congolese are asking themselves, what purpose did the elections actually serve in the DRC? And so we are now facing the following situation. We have a president who has been nominated or to the head of, this head of the state who received less than 7% of the votes in the presidential elections, who is incapable of being able to put into place structural reforms because he does not have the majority in the parliament, nor does he have control over the provinces, the majority in the provinces. As you may know, all the provinces, for at least the most part, at least 22 out of 26 will be, uh, have the majority controlled by the control of Mr. Co uh, Kabila's uh, coalition, the FCC. Consequently, the country has been plunged into a crisis of legitimacy. And this is a serious situation because we are supposed to be ushering in a new era of democracy. And yet what happened in the Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo is a complete defe defeat of democracy. It is therefore difficult for our people to accept such a humiliation. The denial of truth has left the vast majority of Congolese in a situation of extreme frustration. This frustration is still widely felt and very pronounced even three months after the elections of December 30th, 2018. Therefore, two months after uh, Felix Chisikedi has been was sworn in, we still do not have a prime minister appointed to form a government. The violence that broke out in several different regions in the country following the announcement of the senatorial election results, uh, where some people were even killed, is a very good example of the expectations that are not being met of the Congolese people who understand that they have been sold, that they have been sold out and that they will not see democratic transition and that this is simply a new extension of the Kabila system, a system that was not able to bring solutions to the people for the 18 years that it was in power, and it is certainly not going to be able to be done so under a president who is a president in name only. The continuity of the Kabila system through Mr. Chisikedi is going to allow predators of all types to continue their uh, corrupt corruption activities pillaging our uh, resources of our, the, of our country. Institutional insecurity will push the entire world to uh, 
to uh, take a step back and will not encourage investors, serious investors, to come to the DRC. Mr. Kabila certainly does not want Mr. Chisakedi to, re to succeed there where he was not able to, where he failed. They will both be seeking to have an instable balance, and they will be uh, playing a sort of stop-and-go game. And it is, of course, the Congolese people who will suffer the most. What Congo needs today in order to move forward are the basics. In order to envision a better, a better future for the country, it will be important to keep in mind the words that are in our Constitution and say, as, and I quote, since its, since its independence on June 30th, 1960, the DRC has been plunged into recurring ongoing political crises, the source of which is linked to the lack of legitimacy of its institutions and the leaders of these institutions, end of quote. Despite the lessons we've learned from history, partners of the DRC have preferred to choose political expediency rather than moral rigor and ethical rigor. However, only by strictly following the rules of the democratic game will we be able to avoid instability in the future. Legitimacy is the foundation upon which executive action is based. In the absence of legitimacy, you can talk about a government governance, uh, uh, but a governance, a go governance that is challenged and that is going to be challenging in terms of the positive results it can achieve for its population on the economic and social letters. The word democracy means the will of the people. It means the people being part of a vision and a political platform. During the campaign, during the electoral campaign, my coalition, La Muka, was the only co coalition to publish and articulate a coherent platform with statistics and figures. Our platform called for investing in the citizens as the basis for development in the DRC. It's an ambitious platform, $126 million to be spent over five years uh, to focus on boosting the Congolese economy and giving the country the adequate structures it needs to be able to fulfill its ambitious reforms. Uh, here are a few of the main pillars of this platform that I'd like to stress. First of all, education. In the 60s, the Congolese government mobilized 26 to 30 percent of its national budget to spend on education. Today, the government is allocating only 8 percent of its budget to education. And in, this is what's allocated, but in execution, actually only 5 percent is really being spent. Investment in human capital is an indispensable condition for development in our country. Rule of law and justice. As long as the culture of impunity continues to prevail, as long as economic cri crimes uh, continue to go un unpunished and crimes of blood continue, the DRC will not be able to make progress. Peace and security. Securing the populations in the eastern part of the country, uh, throughout the entire country, but specifically and more uh, particularly in the eastern part, and being able to dismantle all the gr armed groups is, an, is uh, necessary in order to bring about peace and security to the country. To this effect, we must undertake deep reforms of our security sector and the UN mission, the MINUSCU, also must be given a new mandate that would be more uh, in line with the uh, requirements on the ground. Diversification of our economy. Congo derives most of its uh, revenues for, for exportation, or from exportation from uh, mining resources. It is important to look to the future and to develop sectors 
where we can also have comparative advantages such as in agriculture and energy. Improving the business environment. We need to lessen the administrative burdens and the red tape involved, and we need to also continue to fight continuously against corruption in order to create a positive environment for business to attract investments and have uh, the, uh, the revenues we need for development. Uh, d territorial development, Congo is a vast country, uh, four times larger than Texas. Yet its potential cannot be fully developed if all areas of the country are not linked through roads and modern railways, which would allow us to have rapid transportation of people and goods. Finally, the environment and climate change. As, as the second lung of humanity, if you will, we have an obligation to protect our ecosystem for all the good of all humanity. If Western economies have based their development and growth on fossil fuels, we must be innovative and base our growth and development on renewable energies. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clear that in the current state of affairs, nothing of what I just mentioned seems as though it could be probable or possible in the DRC. By nature, I am optimistic. However, honestly, in all honesty, I have a hard time envisioning how we could build a country that is worthy and prosperous on lies, how we could build our country on lies, corruption, and corruption that starts at the very highest levels of the government. However, I do feel that there is a solution for the current crisis and that if this, these solutions are put into place with the assistance of the international community, the United Nations, the African Union, that if we were able to do this, we could put the DRC back on track after having been uh, derailed, after the derailment of following the elections. If a recount of the votes is no longer possible, if we are not able to do a recount of the votes, polling station by polling station, as our electoral law provides in the DRC, if this is not possible on the grounds that, uh, that the uh, rec records have disappeared, then I would make the following proposal. I feel that we should organize a dialogue between the stakeholders in the DRC to decide to hold new elections after a period of time to be decided upon, but we would propose a period of 12 to 18 months. So therefore, to hold new elections after this time period, all elections, presidential, legislative at the national level, legislative at the provincial level, also the elections of the senators, elections of uh, local uh, uh, leaders and uh, also leaders of the provinces. So we should hold these new elections so that we could, in fact, finally allow the will of the people to triumph through the polling place. And during this period, this interim period, we should create a government institution that would be called the National Council for Institutional Reforms. And this institution would be governed by our coalition, La Muca. And it would take charge of implementing all the reforms necessary to allow us to finally hold transparent, credible, and peaceful elections. The National Council for Institutional Reform would need to undertake reforms in the following areas. First of all, the Electoral Commission. Second, the Constitutional Court. Three, our security services, and for <coughs> governance, and particularly uh, the fight against corruption. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take advantage of this opportunity to remind you that the rules of democracy must be applied everywhere in the same manner.
and that there cannot be a double standard when it comes to democracy. There can't be one standard for Western countries and for some African countries, and then a different standard for the Congo. We feel that democracy or elections, that the rules of democracy is the majority. 50.1% is the majority, and that should be the deciding factor. It is not the winner who, or the loser who should win. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable. Um, you've given us a lot of material to think about. And I would like, uh, in the interest of time, to kind of start our conversation, after which we'll open uh, for question and answer from the audience. The Congo, obviously, is going, undergoing another crisis. I don't like to use that term, but that's what it is. And every cycle, every five years, the Congolese have expected change, and often they've had something else, not something that we'll call change. And I think in December 2018, there was much, much higher expectation about finally a page will be turned. And it seems like uh, the country has not moved that, uh, that far. But be that as it may, uh, it's obvious that President Chisekedi has little room to maneuver currently. And, uh, but it appears that he wants to free himself from the Kabila's grip. Um, had Chisekedi reached out to you, what do you recommend the president do to establish his independence from, uh, from Kabila? Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I think we must be people who are serious, who are respected and respectable. Mr. Chitsakedi, I know him very well. I've worked with him. He is a brother. He's a friend. And he only has one solution. And we must all help the country. Mr. Chisekedi signed agreements in the past. Uh, uh, let's recall the discussions that took place in Venice, in Italy, the discussions in Ibiza, in Spain, uh, in France, in Paris, Monaco, with the delegates of Mr. Kabila. And he then retracted these agreements. Now remember, uh, he signed with us and the other six leaders of the Lamuka uh, coalition. He signed on November 11th of last year in Geneva an agreement to choose a common candidate. And we chose a common candidate. And following the signature of this agreement, he said that change is now called Martin Fayulu. And in this agreement, he himself proposed with another colleague that we all sign a commitment saying that if we left this agreement, we would no longer be a politician in the DRC. Yet 24 hours later, he retracted this agreement. And now he has a secret agreement with Mr. Kabila uh, that I'm not, that I don't know of, and the, the Congolese people is not aware of. I understand that the US, France, other countries, the international community are asking him to distance himself from Mr. Kabila. Uh, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, is asking him to free himself from Mr. Kabila. Uh, is this, uh, I mean, complying, if you break every deal that you make, uh, it's an issue. I think it would be very simple and very good for everyone to call for a dialogue, uh, as I said, between stakeholders. And during this dialogue, we will find, arrive at a compromise that will suit everyone. Uh, this compromise is that no one imposes their own point of view. We all provide our arguments, our positions, and we come to a compromise. And then the people of Congo will be in agreement and will not think we have made a deal at their expense. Is there a secret deal? Is that established? And then B, <clears throat> 
how do you expect people to buy into this dialogue concept? Because the other part beside the crisis, Congo has gone from dialogue to dialogue to dialogue. Why will this dialogue be appealing to uh, the population, to so the Congolese people? We have a deal, we have a uh, yes, there is a deal. There is a secret agreement because Mr. Felix Chisekedi himself mentioned it. He said he signed an agreement. Yes, there is a secret deal uh, because a, the representatives of Mr. Kabila uh, came uh, recently to say that uh, Mr. Chisekedi was not complying with the agreement and they wanted me to meet with Mr. Kabila to talk about the situation. I said no. Uh, I didn't think it would be a good thing for Mr. Kabila, Chisekedi, or myself, or the people. So I said, uh, regarding the dialogue, if you think you cannot do a voting recount, uh, let's bring it out into the light uh, so that everyone knows what we're doing. Because the people are the key. They're the legitimacy. They bring legitimacy to the system. So no one else can make you cannot make deals um, without the knowledge of the people. Dialogue to dialogue. Why would the people accept this nth dialogue? Le peuple est là et le peuple nous fait confiance. Uh, the people is here and they trust us. And today, uh, you will see that I have, um, my campaign has mobilized thousands and thousands of people. After the results were announced, I went back, announced, I went back to the people, and there was an even greater movement than during the campaign. So we are the leader. We are coming out front and saying, for the good of the country, without violence, we must have a clear, responsible dialogue in order to bring um, the country out of this nth um, legitimacy crisis. And the people will agree, as an example. When we had a dialogue uh, facilitated by Cinco, uh, which led to the New Year's Eve agreement. Uh, in the beginning, the Congolese people was not in agreement. The people were saying, do not go into this dialogue with Mr. Kabila. However, when we finally got this agreement signed, the people were happy. The people applauded us. Uh, they celebrated the signature of this agreement. So we are uh, leaders, we are capable of leading the people and we can ask the people to follow us in this direction because it's going to be a win-win situation. It's obvious that the DRC faces serious economic, security and political challenges. You did a good job at kind of uh, laying them out. What do you think should be the government priorities and what is a realistic policy prescription to uh, the current situation? I think the priorities for the Congo are well known. It's very simple. We need the rule of law. Uh, that brings us to peace and security. Um, I went to Kivu in 2015. I was in Kivu in Goma and I asked the inhabitants of Goma what do you want me to do for you if I become president tomorrow? And they said, Mr. Fayulu, stop. We know how to grow crop. We know how to raise cattle. What we need, what we want today is peace and we want security. We can't go to our fields because we're being killed, we're being displaced. So peace and security are the main thing. Secondly, education. We must correctly educate our people. Our children currently are very poorly educated. In the Congo, you go to the university, uh, but even if you don't go to class, you get a diploma because you paid. We want adequate education. We want professional education, one that takes into account our resources and our needs. So we want to use the Swiss model, a little bit of the 
German model, and this places much more priority, on, a greater priority on professional education, vocational education. Uh, you have people who are studying law, journalism, etc., but there are no jobs to be had. We need masons, we need electricians. Mm -hmm. So education is a basic building block. Uh, and the education of our parents, of our children who didn't go uh, to school. Um, we need to uh, provide literacy uh, and introduce civics classes, citizenship classes, to find ways to ask people to engage themselves and to learn the Constitution and the laws of the Republic. So education is key. So in this area, we want to bring to bear um, we want to use 30% of the state budget for education. Third priority, agriculture. Congo is a huge country, over 2 million square hectares. And when you go from place to place, you see that there is no agriculture. I've lived uh, in Kenya, I've worked in Kenya, I've traveled all over it. I worked for ExxonMobil, uh, and I was in charge of um, supervising all the networks. Um, there were two companies at the time, so so they were trying to buy back Exxon Kenya. So I've traveled throughout the entire country, and everywhere there is cultivation. But in the Congo, there's hardly any um, cultivation. There's 80 million um, square kilometers of arable land, and yet it's not cultivated. We want to do this. We can bring in corn, which can be uh, grown three times per year. Um, we are now importing corn from Zambia, yet we have the same type of land. Uh, corn could bring in more than $10 billion if we exported it. Uh, currently, we're importing uh, palm oil. The dwarf palm trees were developed in the Congo at uh, the National Agronomic Research Center. Yet, uh, these small palm trees are being used by Malaysia currently, and they're exporting billions of dollars of palm oil. We, we are not taking advantage of this. So agriculture is very important. After this, you have the infrastructure sector. Um, we, I've already mentioned it. And if we have peace and security, and the Congo can become an important tourism destination. South Africa um, has over $10 billion in revenue from tourism every year, yet the Congo has a much more diversified offering. And in countries like Kenya, uh, before uh, there were the massacres they experienced, they received about $3 billion from tourism. In 2017, Rwanda um, had $450 million in tourist, tourism revenue. And at the same time, uh, the Congo only got a little over $4 million. So we have huge touristic resources. So infrastructure, taxes, and that's very important because we want to have a clean uh, economic environment that attracts investors with a win-win um, atmosphere. You come in, you invest, you bring your capital, and you will win. And the Congo must also win. So there are many other things to be said, obviously, but uh, these are the priority sectors to enable the Congo to be a place where Africans, instead of wanting to emigrate to Europe, Africans emigrate to the Congo, or um, Africans who have studied in Europe can go back home. I and finished my studies a long time with friends who still live, 40 years later, still live in Europe. Uh, they, they've lost what they've studied. They, they need to come back to the Congo. And it's this lack of leadership that makes it that so that we cannot offer a auspicious environment for them to return.
I'm sorry, I can't, I can't even ask you questions about this bleak development in the country. Uh, the DRC has, is one of the countries that produces a lot of doctors. You go to countries like Botswana, you find that the majority of doctors in the public health sector are actually Congolese. Yet the health system in DRC is in shambles. Uh, the doctors want to go outside. Here at CSIS, we've written a lot about the Ebola crisis. Can you talk about what you think needs to be done there? You visited, you said you were in Butembo, you were in the region. What can the international do to help? Here's another place where Congo, I think, has a lot of expertise. After all, I think the, the first documented cases of Ebola were in Zaire. So there is an internal knowledge, but the system itself is not uh, working. What are your recommendations? What are your thoughts on those? Yes, I went to Butembo. I visited the response to crisis centers. I spoke to doctors. And so I asked, what is the international community doing? And it is doing a lot. There is money, there is research into a vaccine that, that is being tested and that's well, and it, that's made good progress. So I'm asking the international community to continue this work, but a lot more must be done at the local level. The government must, as you say in English, uh, you have to pull the alarm um, and, and you must create awareness. You must have uh, a lot more information on national TV networks, etc. You must contact, go into the communities, the churches, because there are a lot of churches. We speak about a whole lot of things, but not about health. Uh, you know, when Ebola uh, was in the Equator province, um, Monsignor Mabundu went to the site, went out into the field, and he raised the alarm. And following this, the people in uh, the Equator region uh, became aware. Uh, that, you know, they, they realized that if somebody is sick, you have to bring them to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So at the national level, at the level of the leaders, whether it be political leaders, church leaders, community leaders, we must um, make a big effort. We must organize forums, uh, conferences, discussions. And this is very important. I went to Beni in Butombo, and I didn't see that. And when I had a meeting to talk about it, uh, the bishop thanked me, called me. I met with him for two hours, and he said that the population was even beginning to insult him because they, they were saying Ebola didn't exist. They were saying it was just a pretext being used by the government to not organize elections in their region, that the, and that the government had acted poorly. Uh, well, we had the elections and nothing has changed. So we must act responsibly, hide nothing, tell people what needs to be said. When you arrive at the airport, your temperature is taken, you're asked to wash your hands, that's great. And, and these are measures that uh, the government must expand. And the and, oh, and NGOs, uh, citizen movements, everyone must be committed in this effort because it is an extremely severe epidemic which can cause a lot of damage, not only to the people of the Congo, but the entire world. So the DRC for a long time was a close ally to the United States. It was the center of US policy in Sub-Saharan Africa for a long time. Um, that has fallen by the wayside. It's not been the case. It's almost like the US is not engaged fully. They've engaged a lot in humanitarian, on the humanitarian front. In fact, today, the largest number of resettled refugees in the US are Congolese, which is a sad development. President Chisekedi will be in town this week. And he's determined to reset the relationship between the United States and, uh, and Congo. The US itself has uh, shown a lot of goodwill recently, sanctioning some Congolese officials, including some in the CENI, 
What do you think US policy and the Congolese counterpart need to do to have a closer, more productive relationship that will be beneficial to the Congolese people? Très bien, très bonne question. Good question. I went to Harvard uh, to meet with African country uh, students and with the Ghanaian president. And he said in his speech that Ghana needed development, more development and less aid, and that Ghana was doing a lot for regional integration and that it was taking the opportunity for new partnerships. And yes, the US uh, needs to help the Congo, but it needs to do it in such a way that the Congo helps itself, that it becomes a market, 80 million inhabitants. That's a big market. The, the resources we have, cobalt, coltan, copper, gold, all these resources, and but also human resources uh, are important. You cannot be a, a country that is aided 60 years after independence. There are people who have uh, studied, but they're not working. Indeed, we need to have this relationship with the US. Uh, as a young man at 27 years old, I started at Mobile Oil in the Congo. Uh, there were American expats in the company. Um, so M Mobile would send back remittances to the country, and that was a lot of money. There were a lot of American companies, Mobile, Texaco, Chevron, IBM, and Kodak, etc. A lot of companies. Nowadays, how many American companies are present? Nearly none. Uh, what is the U.S. getting from the Congo and the Congo from the U.S.? It's getting aid. That's it. But as I mentioned, there are some basic fundamental principles. The first foundation is democracy, the legitimacy. Uh, Mr. Chisekedi, yes, can come and speak to the American authorities. But if the Congolese people do not accept him, then you'll end up nowhere. In 2006, someone won, and the international community uh, wanted uh, Mr. Kabila to be in power, and you saw what he did. In 2011, same scenario. So um, the countries are really not moving forward. We're, what did we learn? Mr. Kabila became a multi-millionaire. Their theft is ongoing, corruption. We must implement, we must create a country where the rule of law is the key. We need to have leaders who are competent, who are capable, who can spell out a program that takes into account the complexities of the Congo. It's a complex country. It has nine neighboring countries. That's huge. Uh, and it has, it has the resources that the world needs today. And it is influenced from many sides. You need men with character and who are also flexible, who understand things and who are going to work for a win-win, who have these basic uh, foundational elements. Because you don't want uh, the Congo to be led by a puppet, uh, puppet leader, somebody who is going to be um, pushed to do certain things. I want someone across from me, somebody who knows what he wants, who can say no, but who can say yes when that's needed and say no when that's needed. But somebody with whom you can have a dialogue, you can have a productive discussion uh, for the mutual benefit of our country. So yes, the US. The US is a country, is an honest country. It has integrity. Um, with ExxonMobil, you know, um, mission values are key components. Values are important. 
I don't think I can have a discussion with someone it's to get to expectations and results if we do not share the same values. And that's a very important. Having this value of the love, val uh, work value, honesty, integrity, fight against corruption. We want to, uh, do we want to manage the state to get rich? Or do we want to propose policies that will lead to development, the development of the country? Uh, right now, the Congo is a break, uh, an obstacle to the development of the continent. Um, there is nothing going on because this country, over 80 million inhabitants with all its resources, there is absolutely nothing. Now you have all these young people and all they think about, and, and I know this because I did a lot of grassroots work. I, I went to a lot of places in the interior of the country, in schools, universities, to talk to young people. And they say, Mr. Fayulu, we want to become rich uh, because they're seeing this example. Is this w the example we want to give them? We have real models, real values we can pass on to these young people. I've known you for a number of years. I know a little bit uh, President Chisekedi. You work very closely with the late Etienne Chisekedi. You were one of the young Turks in 1990 during the, uh, the Conference Nationale, the democratization process. You were very close to Felix. You work in the, under the same umbrella. He'll be in town, as I said earlier. Are you willing to meet with him? The people in this room who <laughs> love to see that. Many Congolese have been asking when you too on that personal level will help steer Congo in the right direction. What say you? Are you sure that you want to see that? <laughs> we, uh, yes, Felix, as you said, he's a brother, a friend. We work together. Uh, I worked with President Chisekedi for a long time, since uh, 1990. So. I can guarantee that if I weren't here, the Senko dialogues would not succeed. And when the priests uh, came to receive him, when, when the priests went to see him, when he was uh, received, I was present for those meetings. And many times I saved the situation, rescued the situation. So no, meeting Felix, it's not an issue, but not under these conditions. You have I have to meet Felix openly uh, within the framework of the dialogue with everyone involved, including Mr. Kabila. Because as you said, you want to um, put distance between Mr. Chisekedi and Mr. Kabila. But the dialogue is the best place uh, to do that. Then you can establish that no one has betrayed uh, their oath. If I were to see him today here in Washington, the Congolese people will say, oh, Congolese politicians are all the same. Mr. Fayulu was bought. So I think that for the future of our country and to escape this crisis, I, I, I'm not fighting for me, for, for Martin. Um, Fayulu, I, it's not about myself. I am fighting for the Congo so that the Congo once again finds its proper place in the region, on the continent, and in the world. So the U.S. leaders are going to do useful work. They will contribute to the resolution of the crisis if they push for this dialogue. They promote this dialogue. Me, with my peers, my colleagues from the Lamuka coalition, we're, we're here, and we're going to meet the others, meaning Mr. Felix Chisekedi with his uh, cash coalition, um, who is now in, in a symbiosis with Mr. Kabila, who also has his own FCC coalition, and then things will be flawless and clear. 
and I think it will be in the best interest of everyone and especially the interest of our country. Thank you very much for the time, for answering those questions. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now is question and answer. We have two mics, I think, in the room. We'll take two or three at a time, and then we start. Mr. Wolfowitz, up front here. Please identify yourself and your affiliation. Hello. Yes, I'm Paul Wolfowitz. I was the president of the World Bank starting in 2005. And when I came to the World Bank then, I decided it seemed obvious Africa had to be the first priority of the bank. And I was very pleased to see that in the early part of this century, African countries were making some impressive progress, not just economically, but politically. Politi Is this working? Yes. Politically as well. And I think the two were connected. I think the reason that, that some countries like Ghana were doing well was because they were becoming much more seriously democratic. And I know from that experience also that the absence of Congo in a constructive way in the sub-Saharan African economy is a huge drag on the whole subcontinent. As I'm sure you know, the Inga project alone could provide electricity for all of Africa if the corruption could be dealt with so that the project could go ahead. Uh, my question is against the background of that sense about Africa, which is that I don't claim great expertise about your country. Uh, I did manage to visit there once as president. One of the things that I believe from reading is that so many of the problems of Congo stem from a fundamental lack of security. And that in turn stems from a fundamental corruption of the security forces. I wonder if you would agree with that analysis, and if so, what would you do about it if you were president? Okay. Do we have Okay. Thank you very much uh, for being here today. You're really complete and incisive. Please uh, identify yourself, sir. Oh. My name is Steven Anderson. I'm from the State Department. Uh, during your comments, you referred to the problem of corruption affecting uh, business development. There are also reports that corruption is substantial throughout the judiciary, the criminal justice system, other areas of government. How do you think that can be best addressed by the DRC, and what can the international community do to be of uh, assistance in that area? Thank you very much. Thank you. To go, to go on. Okay, so we'll take two. Okay, then. Please. Monsieur le Président. Uh, for Mr. Wolfowitz, uh, for the World Bank, as you know, under your presidency, we had the Structural Adjustment Program, and there were three countries that were the pilot uh, countries for this. Uh, Ghana, Brazil, and at the time Zaire, which is now Congo, Kinshasa. When you look at where Ghana is now today, Ghana has had five presidents, and these presidents have been elected, they're there. I was in Ga Accra, Ghana, in 2000, no, sorry, it was in 1995 when Rawlings was president, and I was there uh, for Mobil, ExxonMobil. And when I was there, President Rawlings had, uh, had a, a problem with his vice president, but, and, but looking and had, had fired him. But when you looked at the progress that Ghana had made on the economic level, and you look now at all the things they've accomplished, this structural adjustment program is now behind them. In Ghana, they have been able to achieve sub-regional integration. Ghana is now exporting oil, exporting cocoa, and Ghana is even thinking of uh, adapting a second national language, uh, French as a second national language. So the situation for the Congo, the DRC, is very different, and this is also similar to the response I would give you, sir. 
that to, for the Congo to achieve all this, the prerequisite, the true prerequisite is democracy. We have to have rule of law. That is a prerequisite. We have to have leaders who are capable of articulating political policies, who have a vision, and who are able to inspire the population with this vision, and who are able to also uh, lead the population and implement this vision. So corruption, insecurity, corruption, the, all these issues are the consequences of a lack of democracy, of the lack of rule of law. When you have a country such as the DRC, and look at the Ituri region, and you can see that you, you can practically find ground or gold on the ground, or you have other regions such as Palikali, where you have all types of possibilities. There's Colton, there's agriculture, and yet when you do not have rule of law and you have predators, you have people who are profiteers and who only want to make money, and then you have army generals who also think that they can become rich this way, and they protect the mines and they also make money out of doing this, there, there's nothing that can be done. When you have soldiers who are sent out to secure regions of the country, but these soldiers become businessmen, and they themselves start sen selling gold uh, through fraudulent means. So I understand exactly what you're saying. And that's why I believe that we have to start by s focusing on security. That has to be the top priority in our platform. If you have the presidential office, the first thing you have to do is secure the eastern part of the country. We have to establish a military basis in the Beni region, and then this will enable us to provide security for the Kivu region, the entire Kivu region, and even the eastern part up to Ituri, because right now insecurity is also being caused and furthered by these profiteers who are seeking to enrich themselves. Starting with the gentleman here, and then the lady in the back, and then we'll come to your next round. Um, good morning, thank you very much for being here. My name is George Lehner and I'm chair at the Fund for Peace. Could you give us your assessment of, your, um, of what other regional players are uh, thinking about acting and how they're responding to the current situation in the Congo, and maybe most particularly what's happening now between Rwanda and Uganda and how that is impacting the DRC? Thank you. We'll take one, we'll take the, excuse me. Oh, oh you have the Thank mic. you. Okay. Oh, My thank name you. is Anne Luawa. I'm from uh, CUA, Catholic University of America. Uh, merci, Monsieur Fayou. Thank you, Mr. Fayulu, for coming this morning. I have two questions. My first question is, I would like to know what is your role? You're in the opposition now, and if you're in the opposition, then given the experience that we've seen in other African countries, true opposition parties really only find their place in prison because, uh, and you've spent a lot of time abroad, I, so what, what is the limit between you now, or how much time will it be before maybe you are in prison uh, if you try to uh, claim your place as the opposition? But normally in Africa, the opposition is usually in prison. Yeah, ma'am. <laughs> Here up front, and then we'll come to you to the, the next round. Thank you. My name is Alan Ikombo. I am the co-founder of YADI, Young African Diaspora Initiative. Bienvenue à Washington, honorable. Dans ici à Washington. Here in Washington and in so certain other Western capitals, the results of the elections in the DRC are being described as the first time that there has been a peaceful transfer of power in the history of our country. And this, and they're giving the credit to Mr. Kabila, uh, among others. Also, a popular 
uh, uprising has been long, a long time in, com in the coming, uh, and there was a lot of popular uprising before the elections. But this, the, the, this large uprising did not happen. And in these same Western capitals, are pointing to the fact that, that there was not a popular uprising and saying that this actually is uh, expressing the will of the Congolese people and that maybe there is going to be some peace and security. But that seems to contradict your position. What would you say to that? Thank you. And then we'll take the next one. Thank you. to contribute to the foreign policy Voilà. The question uh, about actors in the region. Well, there are several different actors in the region, and we feel that they have a role to play, and that each is playing a role in in its own manner. And I would say that I'm not necessarily able to fully describe what role they're playing right now. I do know that some presidents from region, region, uh, regional countries, countries in the region, have not uh, accepted what happened. Some presidents, I know this. And they felt that the decision of the African Union to call the high-level meeting was a welcome initiative uh, and that would be positive for the Congo, but they didn't really understand how this never happened and how the meeting was uh, stalled. We've been told that the meeting is postponed to a, a, a later date, but uh, they feel that perhaps there's been influence by other African countries. They've cited some examples, South Africa, also the example of Kenya, the example of Tanzania. And I don't know who played what role but I do think that it's extremely important uh, to respect the will of the people, the sovereignty of the people. South Africa is going to be having elections very soon. I don't really think that the Congolese leaders could interfere in the results of the South African elections. So what we need is we need to have regional integration, of course, because no country can live properly and function if Congo is in a crisis. Kinshasa has more than 15 million inhabitants. Uh, Congo Brazzaville has 6 million. So the population of Kinshasa alone is two times that of Brazzaville and many other country capitals. So if there is a crisis in this country, if, for example, in Angola, uh, Congo Brazzaville, this will affect, affect them as well. If, uh, this, well, if we have problems in the DRC, there'll be problems in Zambia, in Tanzania. And today, the weakness of the Congo is preventing these other countries from also developing. So I'm not going to go into details about what such and such president did or what the various presidents have said or done. What I would simply say is that we need to respect each other mutually, and we need to all work together to promote regional integration. The DRC, uh, at the time when it was Zaire, had already started with what we call the economic, econo ec economic community of the Great Lakes uh, countries. And we uh, worked to establish, uh, promote the, uh, the idea of a common passport, of having uh, a, a common currency and so forth. But we haven't gotten anywhere on these efforts today. So I think it's important that we continue working towards this regional integration <coughs> and sub-regional integration. Now, you also are, you asked me the question about being in the opposition. Well, I'm not in the opposition. Today, the opposition, that was before the elections in 2018. We had the elections. The people have won. I claim that I won the victory, and I cannot consider this situation as being a normal situation. It is not normal at all. We have to do everything to make sure that the people are able to re re regain this victory, that the people can regain their sovereignty, and that the leaders be legitimate. So it is important that 
I be able to play this role with the people so that the people knows that it is respected? And as Article 5 of the Constitution says, the so sovereignty belongs to the people. And when the people is called to elections, they will go to the polls and that their decision will be respected because otherwise tomorrow I will guarantee you that no one will go vote and there will be no result. Okay, let's say we just stand idly by and say, let's see what happens. Um, well, Mr. Kabila and Mr. Chisekedi will take the country to 2023 because they're going to reach an agreement because they have this agreement. They've signed. They're going to manage to pay the country together. They'll find ways to stay in power and there will be no reforms. There will be no industrial progress, no investment in Congo. Uh, my friend Diali. Yadi, uh, you're saying uh, that uh, Mr. Kabila is getting credit uh, that people chose peace and security, not nothing else. You cannot have peace and security if you don't have truth. Uh, you cannot have peace and security if the people is not in agreement with you because the people continues to resist, even though it is passive resistance. In 2006, we wanted peace and security. Uh, Kabila didn't win. Everybody knows that at that time. In 2011, um, Etienne Chisekedi won, and uh, Kabila was put in office. Peace and security. We were just going in circles. But when we talked about establishing the dialogue, the US ambassador at the time uh, told me, he said at end of February, early March, he got he hopped on his plane to come uh, back here to D.C. to t say to the State Department, stop, there is no dialogue. Just let Kabila work. And Kabila worked on. And then he decided to seek a dialogue. And that's how um, Venice took place and all the discussions that were brought about, but there was no agreement reached. And in 2013, there was a dialogue, uh, a national dialogue, but not everyone participated. So you had a crisis. And then in 2016, there was a dialogue. And now everybody says Kabila is the red line. But it's not just him. It's the Kabila system is the red line. And this Kabila system is still in place. It's wearing a mask, but he is the one who truly holds the reins. Did you see the Senate elections? He has 92 senators now out of 101 elected senators, and there's still seven to go. 92 senators. He has 341 national deputies. And the Congolese uh, constitution says that the prime minister or the president managers, but it's the prime minister who has the power of signature. It, the prime minister does everything. The president cannot sign anything important if he doesn't sign along with the prime minister. So the government is going to be Kabila's government. And when will we push back? So the US's decision uh, you yourselves know this. You're you're here. I've I've read everything that senators said. Uh, all the representatives said the letter they sent to the State Department. Uh, I read the article in Foreign Policy uh, that asked both questions. But three days prior to that, there was a position established, and three days later, this position changed, saying. OK, we are duly noting and even congratulating uh, Mr. Chisikedi. Even today, uh, Germany and France did not um, extend congratulations, uh, Belgians. Even the UK, f for the English, for the, for the UK, the only embassy, the only uh, international organization that was allowed in was the UK. The ambassador of the UK was there in person as an observer, and he was very upset. He said, how? 
while we were counting the results, establishing the official reports, we learned that the results were being announced, that the provincial legislative elections were being announced. I, that wasn't possible. If we are true men and women in this world, we want to promote values. How can someone understand or even accept that results that are going to come out of manual official reports um, actually came from an electronic source? And yet, the electronic vote was forbidden, prohibited by electoral law. So these results that were emitted by the servers of the CINI. They, they gave us a number, and this number agreed uh, with the CENCO numbers. So now the entire world must wonder, what do we want? Uh, we want Kabila to go, Mr. Kabila to go. But if the results were announced in the way that they were decided by the Congolese people, there would be no problem. Look at us, three months on, no government, nothing. We have nothing. You asked a question um, about the Congolese that did not uh, go and protest. Uh, that's very dangerous. The international community needs to be clear on what it wants. You say no violence. But when the people go to, out into the streets, Mr. Kabila kills. So if people had gone out into the streets, there would have been people killed. You know what happened in Kikwit? In Kikwit, it, on February 10th, there was a mass protest in the streets, and they were killed uh, by a general. Ask MONUSCO. They have a report they've issued on this. Ask uh, the other human rights organizations. They have reports on this. There were people killed. But the system, the, the powers that be, said, no, that was tribalism that caused this. That the Fayulu uh, community attacked the Chisikedi uh, tribe, and there was there were killings because of that. I sent people, I also went myself, uh, and I visited the communities, all of them. And the people who were killed, not a single one of them was from the Chisikede uh, community or from the Kasai. I saw the Kasaians because these two communities, they're the same people. They have the same names, the same customs. It's the same people. But um, there was an attempt to, to use this. And Monusco came to see me with the former prime minister. And it said, go to Kikwit quickly. Uh, just there, there's going to be massacres. The, the tri tribalism uh, has reared its ugly head. But we saw it was a trap. So if people had gone out into the streets, there would have been killings. Uh, remember the protest um, from January 2015, uh, where Kabila was uh, upset. Uh, the ambassador, including the U.S. ambassador, called us to calm the population. There were killings, massacres, uh, you know, basically, yeah, massacres. We told the population, calm down. But what we're going to do is we're going to come to you to thank you for what you've done. And if you're not in agreement with the results, show it. And indeed, I went back traveling since uh, February 2nd. And you can see that there are more people who are coming to see me uh, than during the campaign. So we have to be responsible. The Congolese people have their own way of reacting. Uh, don't think that there, if you think there is peace and security, no, it's not there. The people are angry. They're frustrated. And a frustrated people, you cannot predict how they will react. The Tunisians were there. The Algerians were there. See what they're doing today and be careful. Because on February 16th, uh, 1992, we had... And um, this week, the week of uh, January 19th to 25th, 2015. Be careful of the people. Okay, and we take one more question. 
and the gentleman at the end. So we start here and here and then there. Thank you so much to you both for a great talk. I'm Jeff Cote O'Donnell from Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, thank you for engaging with my article. Uh, you experienced a defeat uh, through electoral manipulation, and Congo has a very young population, and they watched this. What would you say to a 20-year-old who aspires to run for the presidency one day, uh, given what you've been through? Alors, le Congo a une population assez jeune. Que direz-vous à un jeune de 20 ans qui aimerait un jour se présenter comme président Tout à fait. Axios, um, you mentioned that Mr. Kabila continues to hold the reins of power and you also referenced his wealth. Uh, I'm curious how he can be convinced to give up um, the reins uh, given all of the wealth and interests that he presumably feels he needs to protect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, your question is indeed relevant. And this is uh, the issue for me now. We want models, we want examples. What will we say to the young people who are 13 years old or were recently 13 years old during the, the vote, 13, 14, 17? And in five years, if there are elections, then what will we say to them? We cannot hide the truth. Uh, that's why I have a lot of respect for the Catholic Church. Uh, Cardinal Monsengo, what he said in Brussels, and Monsignor Obongo, the Archbishop of Kinshasa, who was here, and he met with some of you and met with some leaders here, or also in France and Belgium, and he always says the same thing. That yes, Felix Chesikedi is there, but it is Martin Fayulu who won the electoral um, election, the presidential election, because the truth is that you cannot go against the truth. I have no problem saying to these young people, OK, let's stop discussing uh, things. Let's stop the debate. Uh, because they are calling on me. They, they are contacting me. They're saying, Fayulu, are you going to drop us? Are you going to leave us? Are you going to stop midway? Uh, are we going to convince you, be able to convince you to take a position? And will you accept it? So I said, yes, let's keep going. And I said it at Harvard University, please continue to educate yourself, to acquire the necessary skills, to gain the necessary values, to form your own character. Don't be just a yes man, the, the inability to say no to. Because if you need someone who just says yes, yes, yes all the time, you're going to see uh, Kabila has, has it all. Every, everyone thought he was a yes man, but when he uh, disappointed, he really disappointed. So I'm telling young people, continue to fight. And this is why I very much appreciate and I congratulate the young people from movements like Anusha. Uh, and these young people who are continuing to fight, more so these young people, more so than adults, they are aware that they have to fight for the country. Um, and the Congolese elite is the one that sometimes takes corruption uh, and that wants, that easily abandons the fight. But the young people do not abandon the fight and I will continue by their side. That was a very good question, and here's what I would say. What can we do to uh, make Kabila step aside? Well, 
It's very simple. I've been fighting for this. Etienne Chisiketi asked us to not go into the National Assembly. He said no. But what I'm saying is, President, stay out of this. Uh, fight for a certain period, I'm going to go into the National Assembly. And we went into the National Assembly and we prevented Kabili from changing the Constitution. He did everything he could to change it. Uh, and all of his people were, even the former president of the National Assembly wrote a book called The Republic, excuse me, The Constitutional Revision or the inability of the nation. He wanted to change the Constitution, but I fought hard against this with the others to prevent him from doing so. Today, it's very simple. You have to let the truth come to light. You have to let the truth of the elections be told. People need to be able to express themselves. And so the solution I'm proposing of having a dialogue is uh, an important step. We have to see what we can do together. And what we can do is uh, look at how we can lead the country, how we can uh, create the institutions that we need uh, and create this institution that we're calling a National Council for Institutional Reform uh, so that we can look at these institutional reforms. Great Britain has financed a lot of reforms for the police and security sector. But reforms at the judicial level, uh, millions of pounds have been spent, but the justice uh, has not been fully reformed. And this justice system, the Constitutional Court, the police, the army that has been funded and reformed supposedly, it's the same army that we now see today at, at, at all, all the workshops, all the conferences that have been organized to fight against corruption. What have we gained out of all this? So no, the only solution is to go to a dialogue for everybody to present their uh, ideas on the, and put them on the table. And then, as we say, uh, through the force of our ideas, we will shed light on, on everything. And we, so we discuss the issues, we find a compromise. And out of this compromise, Kabila would have to leave flawlessly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin Fayou. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci. Thank you.